The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Lord, be on my mind, be on my lips, and in my heart. There was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus told them, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And so they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves good wine first. And then when people have drunken freely an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs at Cana in Galilee and so revealed his glory and his disciples began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Today's gospel is a rare time we actually have this reading, the wedding of Cana. And it's in John's gospel. And in John's gospel, right at the end, it says this is the first of Jesus' signs. Other gospels refer to, and often we refer to, Jesus' miracles. This gospel never refers to Jesus' miracles, but expounds upon seven signs. And this is the first sign. And they're called signs because in John's gospel, we are meant to see deeper meaning in the events, the miracles that really happened. And they're recounted for us. John has chosen seven of us because he believes they have particular insight. And so this particular passage, especially when Jesus calls his mother woman, which probably isn't a good way to refer to your mother for the children present, is kind of indicating to us that there's a deeper meaning and there's a symbology. And part of that meaning is pretty simple. You know the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Last week we celebrated the baptism of the Lord. And those three Gospels, Jesus' public ministry begins with his baptism. The heavens open, the Spirit descends, and we hear, this is my beloved Son. John does not describe that scene. Instead, at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, he describes this scene. Now, it doesn't mean that he's contradicting. They are supplemental, more insight into the deeper mystery of who Jesus is. But John portrays this as the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Because, for two reasons, the Old Testament prophesies that in the end times, wine would flow from the mountains and the hills in Amos and Joel, an abundance of wine. And so immediately, someone who's familiar with the Old Testament thinks of this. And they recognize that this is the promised time that God has brought about. 
But there's also another powerful reason in symbolism. Not only was the new t end times predicted by a flow of abundance of wine, in the first reading we heard today, it says something beautiful. Let's see if I can remember it. It says, as a young man marries a virgin, your maker will remember you, marry you. And as a bridegroom delights in his bride, so will God delight in you. Right? John is showing us that Jesus is not simply a continuation of the Old Testament. It is something totally new. A love affair where God marries his people. To further this interpretation, in this gospel passage, Jesus is being portrayed as the true bridegroom. It's hard to see at first, but in John's Gospel, chapter 3, John the Baptist is going to refer to Jesus as the bridegroom, and he's the best man, and I must decrease so that he must increase as I point him out to you. But in the Gospel, remember after the head waiter tastes the wine and says, wow, this is great, he calls the bridegroom and says, you have provided the best wine last. You see, it was the role of the bridegroom to provide the wine at the wedding. And it was the role of the mother to make sure the bridegroom provide the wine. And so we see Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is the bridegroom, the true bridegroom that the head waiter didn't really recognize. And so, Mary is the mother, Jesus is the bridegroom, who is the bride? We didn't hear anything about her, did we? It could be that it's a patriarchal society and didn't bother mentioning the woman because she's not important. But it might also be because you are the bride. God marries us. Jesus is the bridegroom, both men and women, and he marries us. And what's fundamentally different between the Old Testament and the New Testament is this relationship with Jesus. The gospel ends and says his disciples began to believe in him. The water was in the ceremonial washing jars for the Jewish religion, and the water became wine. The Old Testament had its laws. The Old Testament had its traditions. And people would follow those traditions, philosophies, laws, rules, but the New Testament, we follow Jesus. And it's a love affair with a person. And that is like changing water into wine. Because by that supernatural love and power, we are able to fulfill God's role and will for us. Think of it another way. You know, God, creator, giver of the law, could have stayed in heaven. Right? God created us perfect, perfectly loving in his image. We sinned and turned from that. God could have stayed there in heaven after he gave us the law to try to bring us back and wait for that time of judgment where he would judge us. But God doesn't want to do that. God wants to change us before that judgment time. And so God comes into our humanity and joins himself with us and the two shall become one like in a marriage. And that union is meant to change people like it is hopefully does in a good marriage. You've heard it said before, right? Boy, and I'm going to pick on guys here. That marrying that woman is the best thing that ever happened to that guy. He really cleaned up his act after they got married that happen? Can you guys relate to that? Any husbands out there want to turn at her wife right now and say, you're the best thing that ever happened to me? Go ahead. <laughs> You've really made me a better person. Okay. 
Any wives out there want to do that to their husbands? You can go ahead. <laughs> but this is the way humans are. We are changed not by being preached at, not by being told the truth. We are changed by a loving relationship with someone who transforms us, whom we give ourselves over to, whom we love so much we want to change so as to be more close to them, to please them. We admire and adopt their good qualities, and the two shall become one. And so it is with Jesus. We are meant to marry our maker, perfectly human, perfectly God, and that union transforms us. And how does that union more transform us? It is through the power of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit actually dwells in us. And the wine represents that Spirit. Just as our lives can be lived on a natural level, but they're meant to be lived on a supernatural level when we enter into that relationship with God. The wine fills us with, now, in a good sense, if we don't abuse alcohol, it's representative of joy and vigor and passion. And so our lives like water, become transformed into wine when God's Spirit dwells in us. Romans chapter 5, verse 5, I believe, says, the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul in Ephesians, I think it's 5, verse 8. But check it out. It says, don't be intoxicated by wine... That is debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, the two are being contrasted. God's Holy Spirit is God's love, and it so fills us when we enter into a relationship with God that we receive through the sacraments, that we receive and it unfolds in prayer, that that love helps to transform us by the relationship with Christ. The water is turned into wine. That wine overflows, right? It was abundant. Six jars, 20 to 30 gallons. I think if you do the math, don't quote me. What's that, 120 to 180 gallons of wine? It's a lot of wine. But the abundance is even more. It comes down from generation to generation in this Eucharist, being poured out for us. And so... That's some of the significance of this passage. Our relationship with God is likened to a marriage. But in conclusion, there's another thing you hear sometimes about two people who are married or about to get married. Sometimes you hear it a little bit negative. Oh, they're not right for each other. He or she's making a big mistake. They are not compatible. This is only going to lead to heartache. Well, someone could have said that to God. Someone could have said that to Jesus. Because although God is perfectly faithful and has become vulnerable and entered into our humanity and married us, how many times have we been unfaithful? How many times have we been unaware or unappreciative of all God has done for us? And like a lonely lover, God continues to wait. And so let us not let him wait any longer. Let us heed the call of our mother, our mother-in-law, and do whatever he tells us. Let us follow him the best we can with our natural abilities, like the water, filling up those containers, and then allow his love and his Holy Spirit to transform that water into wine, till his joy overflows in our lives, and we are born again, renewed, and transformed in his likeness.